Guten Tag, and welcome to another quality content module freshly ground by Small Beans, where ideas are always percolating. If you enjoy this pod, please consider joining our community over at patreon.com slash smallbeans, where only three bucks a month gets you access to double the content, including Patreon-exclusive series like Spielboys and Star Trek The Next Futurama, plus bonus episodes of your SB favorites. Much love, and enjoy the thing. Every, every interaction I have that's not recorded is just like extended lead in to the podcast that I'll <laughs> exactly. have with that person, you know? Yeah, it's all just revving up for a podcast. Yeah, yeah I, I realize that. Like, me and Michael, and me and you, and me and Adam, like, we talk on, we'll, we'll chat on Discord or whatever to play video games but since like the uh since like you know the pandemic has kind of i guess moved on or rather we stopped playing video games all the time since like 20, 2020 we need a new like universal game i'd say 90 percent of what we talk when we talk it's being recorded right which is that's can't be healthy for Probably actual human not. relationships right but it also i don't change when we talk on recording, like when we're That's playing true. video games and stuff, like it's the same bullshit, right? We should be charging for that. If yeah. anything, everything should be recorded, right? <laughs> we should lean into it. Nope. We uh, <laughs> but Truman show know, this. I mean, you, you say that, but right before we recorded, you mentioned how you're like, man, I got to get caffeine because I have to, you know, you have to be up. You have to be, there's a performance. So you yourself are a liar. <laughs> um, and let's let's inspect uh, the wiles of morality as we yes. enter a frame rate. That's right. It's frame rate. Michael is out again this week. He shall be back soon. Uh, but that's but today is not the day. Uh, so mm -hmm. I have uh, so I'm a person and I have my good friend David Bell here. Yes, I am. I you have cloned Michael and I am taking the punishment for him. You sound just like a man. Yeah. But this is uh, some fucked up. This is a fucked up movie, right? Yeah, it's um. So this, uh, yeah, Infinity Pool, right? We, we're, Infinity we both Pool. The same they movie. read it. That's true. Some people just. <laughs> auto I'm just confirming this. to you. <laughs> yes. No. Infinity Pool is what we watch. The the Brandon Cronenberg. Yeah, I mean, this is a uh, Brandon Cronenberg, his second film, I want to say, or it's it's the second film of his. Yeah, I've second watched. feature. The first one okay. was Possessor, which we recorded on this podcast. Uh, yeah, me and Tom did a better separate half. one. Yeah. yeah, we recorded it with Tom. I don't know if I'm going to have to record or we just watch for this movie. I It's not on our on our schedule, and I like really wanted to watch it. And this the end of now story. You have. End of now story you have. about me wanting yeah. to watch this movie. Yeah, this is... Uh, should I explain this movie at all to yeah, people? Yeah, typically on frame rate, we have you uh, do try to keep it... You know, you can keep it short. You can keep it uh, just right. like basically the log line. Like, what's this about? It's about a Skarsgård. Mm -hmm. uh, I forget which. Uh, you know. Alexander. Alex, Alex Skarsgård. He's a writer. He's got uh, what seems to be a rich uh, um, wife whose dad owns a publishing company. They're at a resort. He's trying to look for something to write about. Uh, and they meet another couple. And the couple is like, hey, we're leaving the resort, going out for the day. You want to you wanna come out? And they do. Uh, he gets a uh, uh, he gets an unnerving beach hand job, which doesn't really matter. But I just needed to shout out the unnerving hand job. Yep. Um, and on their way home, he accidentally hits and kills a farmer. Uh, everybody throws him under the bus when he's arrested. And this country, which is clearly some sort of fictional country, what we learn is that their law states that pretty much doing anything is a result of death. You will be killed. And in this case, the farmer's son has the right to kill him. But they're like, but if you give us some money, we'll clone you. And uh, he can kill your clone instead. 
the catch is your clone will have your memories. So it'll be really a, a very confused clone. Uh, <laughs> we're, this should be on the brochure, if you ask me. They should have, you know, this, yeah. uh, they, they, at this resort, they got to be like, listen, it's pretty important you don't leave the resort because they're going to clone you and kill your clone if you do anything wrong. Uh, very weird. But the point is, is that it's it's a very Cronenberg setup, like both him and his father. And it becomes even more Cronenberg when the realization uh, that I, I, I don't know about you, I landed on, I realized what was going to happen pretty quick, is that that means that basically for a small fee, you could do whatever you want on this island because someone else will take your punishment. And so what happens is uh, the Skarsgård actually seems to like watching himself die. Uh, and then he meets, uh, including that other couple with Mia Goth as one of them, like-minded, like rich people who basically to them, it's nothing. It's just a fine. Uh, yes. D does that mean you, c you create a different version of yourselves and kill it? Sure. But to the, someone without morals, this doesn't matter. So this to them mm -hmm. on this Island, it's basically like the purge where they're just rich right. people who can do whatever the fuck they want. And the movie is, uh, uh goes into that. And then it becomes a real mind fuck as these rich people start screwing with uh, the scars guard um, whose wife pieces the fuck out pretty early and good mm -hmm. on her. Yeah. Um, they do stuff like uh, they make him like beat the crap out of someone and reveal that it's a clone of them that they paid to have made. Uh, they, they it becomes this weird demonic uh, well, almost demonic rituals where they're doing drugs and they're fucking and, and he realizes he's gone in over his head and he tries to leave the island and they get him at gunpoint and they chase him into the woods and they basically make him fight a clone of himself and he has to beat himself to death. Uh, and they're like, good job. And then everybody just goes home like nothing happened, uh, except for the scars guard who, uh, you know, didn't have a very good vacation, not very relaxing, I would say. Yep. And uh, he stays at the resort, and that's kind of how it ends, of him sitting in the rain right. at this resort. Uh, you know, because he, again, bad vacation, bad time. He had a yep. bad time. Both of Cronenberg's movies at this point have been about grotesque doppelgangers of some kind, and both are basically about the powerful preying on the quote innocent end quote you know like someone who it doesn't deserve yeah it. someone losing their humanity right like through right. murder um and through like a murder that's like removed in a way um yeah, yeah this is definitely about the idea that with your when you're rich the uh there is no such thing as like if it, it's that classic quote from the final fantasy game where if the punishment is a is a fine then it's you know f it only applies to the poor like right. basically what they uh, Cronenberg has made an extra step to it, which is like, if you don't mind cloning yourself and watching your clone die, then this is a free, this is free. You can do whatever you want. Um, and so it just compounds upon itself. There's a question of course, of like, who's the real person? Who's the clone? Are they a copy of a copy of a copy? Maybe that's why they are the way they are. Um, there's no telling, you know, there's that mind fuck of like, they never do anything with it. It's not the prestige, um, uh, but it does. They bring up the question of like, does it fuck you up to think maybe I'm the clone? Uh, yeah, they're real like, monsters yeah. about it because they because uh, I think and it, the that's kind of the key of the title um, that they kind of peering into this concept of immortality which as we, you know, I mean, vampire lore has kind of talked about this at times yeah. like where it's like, if you really don't see life the same way as everyone does and it's no longer precious and you no longer see your life as precious or anyone else's, what will you be capable of and what will you like and what will like pass the time? Right. Um, and on this, they're very like, they they try to be polite at first, but the more they talk, the more it's clear that they're very racist against the people on this island. They just think of them as savages, and yeah, they, they don't do. think their lives matter. Which is, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> this is a movie about m murder tourism, but it's also really a kind of a takedown of tourism itself. Yeah. Like there are old, there are uh, multiple references to like colonialism or the way that we do tourism, especially for most like for white people 
watching yeah, other other cultures kind of become simplified. At one point, they're at a Chinese restaurant with like a white server who's basically acting like he's Chinese. Right. Uh, there's at one point a cut to a Bollywood play. Um, which is just like real basic. And at one point there's a shot, which to, uh, to the dismay of a lot of people who didn't catch this, I think, uh, there's just a shot of some ridiculous facsimiles of like Hasidic Jewish people at one point. Right. And it's basically painting tourism as horrible yeah, and reductive I mean, and something for the pleasure of the rich. Again. It's, it's no accident that it takes place at a highly like fortified resort, right? Yes. Like that's the whole point is that it, it's it's the uh, Onion article. A woman who loves Brazil has only seen four square miles of it. Right. Uh, yeah. Where it's like, yeah, they they don't like they show they make a note to show like it's like r- you know razor wire fences to keep them safe and they're not right. supposed to leave. Uh, yeah, and that's a big yeah. part of it. Um, and so I thought of other movies like this, and obviously Possessor comes up. Like, um, yeah. And, you know, there's obviously, like, Are You the Clone? Kind of, like, Six Day with yeah, I, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. My biggest compliment to this movie is it could have easily been about that. Are You the Clone? And right. while there's, like, a little of that, they he found a much more clever use of this sci-fi trope. I thought. I had a different take on it. But uh, a movie I wanted to talk about with you, and, it, like, just as a uh, kind of way in which you approach... I guess the rich people problem, because we're starting to get it kind of a, you know, more a movement going on, would you say, uh, in movies? Uh, whereas a movie like Parasite uh, mostly tries to create sympathy for the poor. Yeah. This movie goes whole hog in, at vilifying the rich and painting them as having no consequences to the life, like you talked about, oh. and how it corrupts and how they seek power and new exciting ways to experience life. Um and I thought that Parasite does that a little bit um, in that it does paint them. It paints rich people as unthinking and unsympathetic, uh, but they're just trying to live their life. They're just very privileged. This is not privilege. This is uh, you are so, a fucking monster. Yeah, you know? I'm, I'm glad you brought this up because I, I, I just want to note I didn't love this movie. Um, yeah, I thought I it thought, was okay, and right. I can tell you exactly what the problem I had with it is. Uh, me too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it is the character of James that is Alexander yep. Skarsgård. Um, they never try to explain why he likes this. Um, the other rich people, you can oh, kind of because you're just meeting them, you can kind right. of say like, "Oh, I'm sure they have all have their own origin story." But the problem is, is that throughout the film, James draws a series of lines. Mm-hmm. And the lines feel arbitrary because they do. That's the the por- that's the in- interesting part, or that's yeah. the part that really ruined it. Uh, he's a to privileged, me. yeah. He's a privileged uh, uh, writer, and like he he's married into money, but he doesn't. He's not. He's not. He's rich. not like naturally rich. He's yeah. married, rich, and he kind of despises it. Uh, actually. Yes. Uh, he hates it. He's ha- he's handed a book deal because his wife's dad is a publisher. So he became withered and toxic toward her and their relationship and himself because he felt like his power was taken, which is something that rich people do. Yeah. So he is kind of a victim in that in like kind of how we start, which I thought was kind of interesting. But I think like more to your point, I was the same. I felt that act one and act two did a great job of just giving us this outrageous premise because i mean like we can pick it apart that's fun sometimes and maybe we'll do it by the end of this podcast but right now i want to talk about how act three really fucked it up and you mentioned something that i thought was interesting which is that you had a hard pro you had a problem believing that he would find this enjoyable i didn't have that problem well i mean i had the same inconsistency sorry it's more that after he started drawing lines later that's when I started going, well, what it like, because uh, so the idea that he finds it enjoyable, I can understand where it's like, okay, something sparked this in him. Sure. That's the point of the movie. That's the offer, right? Is for whatever reason, this character, but then uh, he later, like they literally like applaud their own execution in one scene. So he's like, he has no trouble with watching himself die. Uh, this clone mm. of himself. Um, but the thing that makes him go, I'm out, is when they tell him they're kidnapping the police detective 
and they reveal and, and he they, beats him up, up and, yeah and they reveal which it's is clone. stupid because we've already seen a version of him that has no problem with exactly. murdering himself exactly so it's inconsistent in that way yeah uh, i also found that about an hour and 15 minutes into the movie we get the uh, orgy scene where they're like it's the height of them and it's the final beat more or less or should be the final beat more or less of them going like yeah these fuckers are fucked up you know like they right. will morally they are corrupted uh to such an extent that they have now put in every sin you can think of and they just want to you know lap it up um and that's where i think the movie was basically a started decadent beats because that's where i'm like movie you got a zag now it's not just these people are bad so let's show you how rotten even if the stakes aren't higher uh they and then the movie continues to show they treat the wait staff poor, like poorly, and they're like, "Yeah, let's go rob a hospital." And they uh, they've already kidnapped and killed people at this point. The stakes have not raised at that. Yeah, juncture. and then you the know, once the orgy hits, it's like there is no farther you can go. And Cronenberg chooses to kind of stay on the rails there. I was waiting for something to like change again. Yeah, um, and when they like, I guess the turn is that they start hunting James. But right. honestly, I didn't care because James was a monster. Because James is a monster like them. They yeah. painted them as a monster. Right. And then and so I guess the twist is at the end, they were never going to hurt him. It was just more fun in games. And in the end, they're just like, all right, let's get... Like, I think they. this was all leading to the idea that they're all on the bus going back to the airport and they're talking about, like, their house sitters and shit. That's, like, sort of the punchline. But it did feel like there just wasn't... The, I think the issue is is that he was trying to say something about he was trying to tell like a fable right like it's a it's a thought yeah. experiment it's this broad idea which is again clever I like the idea of like in a world where you get cloned and your clone takes your punishment there will like the only limit is your own morality if you mm. don't care about that then you can do whatever you want. And if you have the money, so like we have this dynamic where on the island, the people can't afford to do this. So like they can basically, I I thought it was going to be more of them like victimizing the island. Um, and maybe the island fights back or maybe the <coughs> cop does something. But there's, the problem is, is that in order for that thought experiment to work, you just, you have to fill in a lot of blanks too. Is like, yeah. why is the cop allowing this? Why isn't he like deporting them? Why isn't mm -hmm. he like, no, you're killing our people. Like, why isn't he putting uh, them on surveillance? Right. Uh, in you fact, know? that was one of the best beats in the movie was the six day, am I a clone? And the reason I think that they got that or the or why it worked on me because I had already thought in my head I was like oh I bet they're gonna do so like what if the clone screams right before he dies when he's murdered for the initial instance of the murder of the clone he's like I'm not the clone and right. then we have a real six day on our hands but like what's to me what the problem there becomes or what they kind of immediately address is that the chief of police or the detective walks in and he's like, you bunch of fuckers, I'm feeling like today we don't have a loophole because you're preying on our yeah. people. I and thought that was going to be, I thought he was just going to kill the characters. Yeah. And, and, that, that and I was like, that's going to be crazy. Or how are they going to get out of this? Or like some, you know, like bureaucratic diplomat is going to step in and say, nope. If you want to have these crazy laws where everyone dies because of any infraction, you got to have, you know, like the loophole. But no, they went for he just does that because he, the p chief of police, takes pleasure from having power over the clones as well. Yeah. So it's always a one way street. And it's kind of an indictment of humanity at that point. And anyone involved in the system of the rich people and like the loophole. So it's not just the rich who benefit. It's also anyone themselves becomes corrupted by that power. Right. And um, I guess and that's not that's good, but it's not doesn't solve your act three is, I guess, what I wanted I, to say. Yeah, I guess to me, what is missing um, from all this is so he had the broad strokes. He had the thought experiment done. What I don't think he landed was how do the humans interact with this experiment? Like, that's what it felt like is no one really exactly. felt like a human. Uh, exactly. Everyone felt like, like you said, as a fable. And this is where I wanted to bring up Parasite again, because yeah. that that movie spent 
like a good, if we remember, it spent about a good hour or so, hour, 10 minutes, juxtaposing sympathy for the poor characters and light disdain for the rich characters. But then we get a bombshell about the same part of the script where it happens in Infinity Pool, where it's like in Parasite, it's uh, about how far will the poor go to survive off the rich and how the rich survives on the poor to kind of not only show here's where they start, but we go from general saying something generally about the rich and the poor to something very specific saying these particular people will go this far. Now, this movie doesn't really do that. It goes specific very quickly within Act 1, and it says, you, Alexander Skarsgård, will do this given this opportunity, and it's all of the stakes. And so there's, the movie doesn't really have anything. Like, it's definitely shocking, but it does not lead me as an audience member to ask questions like, how far will these people go to do X, Y, Z? Which is, frankly, the story problem of Infinity Pool. And I think it was a little bit of Possessor. Grand, uh, very interesting thought experiments and premise. But ultimately, when it comes down to and how do you kind of stretch that story... Where you go becomes now the destination. Yeah. And I don't think that he chooses the right destination every time. That's think, just my take. And, yeah, I think Possessor, yeah. I liked that way more than this one. Um, I think he didn't have as much of a problem because we kind of understand more where that character is at that point in her life. Mm -hmm. Where it's like, oh yeah, she's losing her humanity through this process. Um, I don't need to see an origin story. Obviously, there's still a lot of questions. He's, you know, it's when you make these bold offers, it's like there's a lot of logistical stuff that mm. you either have to choose to ignore or it's going to bother you, right? Yeah. Where again, like this world, it's like, how is this? Why is this cloning even being allowed? Like, <laughs> why is uh, there a fucking resort on this in this country if this is what's going on, etc.? Um, yeah. It's like if we had a resort in like North Korea, right? Where it's like, wouldn't we have terrible <laughs> relations with these people? Right. There's so many questions. If this yeah. wildly silly law were to exist, why would they make you watch? Yeah. <laughs> also, why not clone the victim instead of just have like the victim's son right. do a murder? Like, how about save your also the victim's son from a traumatic experience right. and so save them or something? I don't know. I understand yeah. that someone can be like, that's not how the technology works. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. But, but there's, um, there's a lot of style over substance here. And exactly. like the, the thing about that, um, <laughs> this is what I th find interesting is that you can literally make the same accusations of like a Marvel film. It's all mm -hmm. kind of the same thing, which is like if a movie is so big on its style, uh, and the plot stops making sense that can apply to, huge blockbusters and to art house films and people yes. will accept them both ways. Cause it's like, I think people will accept a movie like this cause it's artistic, mm -hmm. but, um, and that's, you know, again, that's fine. That depends on the viewer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But and I couldn't help but to think about that throughout. Like, for example, why is the cloning machine like a sex disco? Like when yeah. he gets cloned, you, he sees like flashes of Mia goth naked uh, and it's like it, it's like a rave machine. It's like <laughs> it's yeah, like yeah, it starts yeah. playing rave music at him. And you're in goo. Yeah, and I'm like, I I did they have to design the cloning machine to be and like you this? got these mouth spreaders and a condom hat. I knew that that was your shit, Dave. Oh, that was, was great. Was, the mouth <laughs> spreaders and condom hat. I yeah. mean the the actual like it became like a fucking discotheque. Yeah, it did. Like it. There's there's these like you typically get from a Cronenberg uh, these kind of hallucinogenic kind of sequences where it's kind of editing pretty quickly uh, like a barrage of color and light and dark and it's like you know what you see but sometimes it's intercut with Sometimes it's just lights, you know, just lights being shined at your face. So yeah. there's a photosensitivity warning on oh, this yeah. movie as well. My guess <laughs> is that that reflects the drug sequences. And I think mm -hmm. what we want, what we're, what's being implied yes. there is that whatever the drugs are, are similar to what the cloning process is. It's or a part like, of this culture. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's a religious and spiritual aspect that they mm -hmm. don't really get into. Um 
Yeah, like you almost, in order to create a clone, you need some horrible trauma to occur or something like that. Yeah. Um, it, but also there's this root that's introduced and you like smoke the root and we don't re- we know that it's a hallucinogen, but we don't really see what it is. It feels like a death root because it seems like, I don't know, one of those like sopping wet black roots like a mandrake in Harry Potter or some shit. Right. Um, but yeah, it's it's ultimately there's something he's he's doing this implication that it's all bundled up uh, alongside in this culture is these this concept that I want to talk about called the Iki masks which is, I know, another one of your jams, because they're these horrible puzzle faces where it's like uh, a lot of uh, instances of like that smack of doppelgangers, you know, where like one face is coming out of another face and this is a mask you wear. Uh, One is uh, basically like a pig human, but uh, their, their mouth is full of money, which once again, we're talking, you know, wealth and colonialism. Right. Um. But I think it's kind of a, uh, it's not just to kind of say like, okay, what is doppelganging and like the idea of like, if you're not yourself, but you're split. Um, that's what he, I think Cronenberg wants you to get into. That's also part of the culture that he's trying to, La Tolka is the name of the, right. um, there's the also, island yeah, that like during the orgy, their faces turn into that a little turn bit. Turn into that. They like fuck uh, with the masks yeah, on. Yeah. There's an idea of mask. like the ugliness beneath them the clones right. the copies of a copy the, copies the idea of, of the what copy. is the like that is what is happening to your soul you know by right. cloning yourself and watching yourself die was that clone did that did you create uh, did you take a piece of yourself you know and put it right. in that that's i think that's the simplistic approach which yeah. is i think the right one i mean that's like a broader but i think he's actually saying something even more specific than that um, because I think what he's trying to say is like, look at our characters and look at how it's not just that they, uh, they're not just rich. They're specifically vain. Uh, even before right. we know that they're really rich or like the details of the relationship we see out of, uh, the, the married couple Skarsgård and, uh, and Cleopatra Coleman that like, he won't go out with the girlfriend to eat, but he will go to eat to the place that he just made fun of to appease adoring fans. Yeah, they 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 set him up as a dick pretty quickly. Right, but uh, it's not just that he's a dick, man. It's specifically that he's vain. Because I think yeah, that that's they, important they when it comes him to... And, yeah. Right, because when we start talking about self-annihilation, I mean, he destroys his marriage, which is ultimately like life bringing right like conventionally right. that's what a marriage quote quote is for uh, he's unable to write or procreate on his own um so he's doing the other thing and i think that uh like what we're i think what we're talking about when he starts when he actually is killing himself it's not just doppelganger and like losing a part of yourself but it's also this cult which you know the wealthy are in of the idolatry of self or solipsism right Mm-hmm. Uh, the idea of killing oneself to become God or gain power or acceptance or truth. Right. Right. Uh, I think that there's a lot of that in this movie and that's why we see layers and layers of faces being ripped apart to reveal more and more faces, which I think is interesting because that's often how people kind of posit empathy. I think a lot of people say when you are thinking, when some people conceive of empathy or sympathy even, as this concept of like, well, what if I were in their place, right. you know, like w- walking in their shoes? What if I were one of them? What if I was a doppelganger, essentially the thought experiment? And that leads people to a positive interaction with other humans where they go, ah, oh, yes, I can see how I wouldn't want that. So I'm not going to do that thing to those people or, you know, like that. This is how the world should work. Now, solipsism is kind of the same thing. And is but on the on the reverse, and I think he's trying to blend those lines a little yeah, bit. Yeah, well, that's the thing is the to me, I interpreted it as self loathing because it's like mm-hmm. it's it's if you don't even have empathy for a literal clone of yourself, mm-hmm. then what does that say about you, right? Like that you can't even have like scrounge up uh, the the effort to like <laughs> care. To watch yourself get executed, right? So, like, it seemed like it was the extreme opposite of that. 
That's <clears throat> so that's an interesting aspect because I do agree with you and I think that that's like, a valuable read of the thing. Right, because it well no but you're right is that he's extremely vain like you said. The ultimate torture it's not how it's is up, them yeah. reading the bad reviews for his book to him while <laughs> right. making him walk down the road. But everything else to me is like well like how what kind of person is fine watching your a clone of yourself die? Mm-hmm. You'd think you'd be ridiculously self-loathing not vain to like that right yes well that's the question because that's yeah. not because here's the thing that i think that actually the movie got right and why i think act one and two are actually brilliant i am gonna flip on the other side and be like this movie does something that few movies actually do because it posited something that i want i found myself checking my own kind of uh, interpretation because of mm-hmm. my assumptions being like kind of knee jerk. And what that is, is if you look at actually what the story is doing, it's not trying to paint a man who's wealthy and a piece of shit. I mean, he is vain, but he's not the, he's not the worst person. He's in fact withered by other people. He is a victim. That's how we start this movie. Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. There's something that I think that is, might be borderline misogynist that, uh, Cronenberg is doing but he is doing it and I I'm hopeful that he's not trying to say this about women or anything like that but like this st- a read of the story is that James becomes like withers his own relationship because he has no control over it right that's right. already being a victim and then when he gets he finds a way quote out or gets into this limbo infinity pool space, he finds himself pathetic again because he's controlled by a woman because Mia Goth essentially is like, you're going to be my sadomasochist little slave. Right. Uh, so was this intentional? Is the ending like, I won't return to what I was because I'm changed is kind of a positive kind of spin on it. But it's also trying to say that he's a victim somehow. Like this naturally yeah. rich rich people can shake it off no problem. But he's more human than them. So he returns to limbo instead. That is an interesting notion because now he becomes a hero. And he's not a villain just like everyone else, right? Yeah, you, that's could, what the you could argue doing. the idea is um, he's a little more pathetic than that. He, mm-hmm. It's not about women. It's about who's like the powerful sure. person who's, who right. is able to like you know like he's attracted to money and power and so right. like he was married into to this relationship that's um, my hopeful read it just happens yeah, to be that it over just the happens course to be the two movie, women it's two overbearing women yeah but i mean mia goth yeah she gives him that again unnerving beach hand job yeah to kind of claim uh possession i guess i don't and, know and this uh, is no and this is not a like in some form of indictment for what his actions. I mean, I do believe that he, him withering the relationship is as much his himself as his wife, uh, right. and her approach. I guess and she's I passive aggressive and like, you know, like, can I go? Is it like at one point she asks like, well, I want to do this. Can I go? And it's done in this weird subservient way right. where it's like, uh, is she asking that really? Because that's it a is, weird thing. Yeah, it ask. is interesting because they have that conversation about her cutting off his balls and like where it's like who's who's, you know, like when they're having that beach yeah. conversation about the domination in right. the relationship, et cetera. I think um, it's about power, like you said. Yeah. But yeah, I, it's it, it's interesting because, yeah, I think you could interpret it as about specifically about women, but it didn't feel that way watching it, at least. I don't um, think so. And I think honestly, it's just an it's, artifact. I don't think anybody can really think this person was a victim. And I, I honestly think that's part of the problem because like looking at possessor, it's similar where you're like, this person is ha- something's happening to them where I'm like, you know, that's unfortunate towards them. But at no point have we established that this person's innocent. You know, they were doing right. terrible things. He's not things. innocent. That's for sure. And yeah. so it's almost like a story of a person doing terrible things, get kind of getting what's coming to them. Which is he's suddenly victimized, but you know he's hanging out with this crowd of sadists. What were you gonna expect, dude? You know, like yeah, they start doing it to him. Yeah, um, and they're like, "You're lesser than us," because I think that's right. what it's trying to say about power. Kind of like the same thing with the, the uh, police detective. 
uh, yes. do, treating the clones. Everyone a part of the system. And it's kind of like Wire-esque if you've seen, like if people at home have seen The Wire. Right. Uh, it kind of posits a thesis that, you know, anyone a part of this system is a part of the system in such a way that they play a role that creates the system's self uh, perpetuating. It's the, um, yeah, it's the and, boss yells at. Yeah, uh, it's the employee, cycle of power. Employee abuse, yell, goes sorry. home and yells at his kid. Yeah, kid exactly. yells at his dog. Like it's it's dog yells yeah, at the, where the cat. He, <laughs> that is, I think, the twist is like he is not like them. They're ultra rich. That's, he's just he's yeah. just leeching. He's just a, a failed writer to them, and they were fucking with him the whole time. Is the reveal? Um, they're not going to kill him. I don't think. I think the idea is like he's he's, he's one like of us. Them. Yeah, he's one of yeah. them in that he's a fellow tourist. But they don't respect him, he, um, right? And they're just fucking with him. Uh, right. Uh, ultimately, is what the it's kind of talented Mister Ripley vibes, right? Yeah. You're. Oh yes, you deserve to be here, but you don't deserve to be here. Like, right. You're just you're allowed to be in. You're one of the poor's. But you're not like the poor. The yeah, poor's are really, really terrible, you know, it, is what he's saying. It's literally uh, like a Mean Girls story. Like you could tell this exact same story with these characters in high of school, a new yeah. kid in high school goes with the bully crowd who are like privileged rich kids and then only to be humiliated by those rich kids when you realize that they don't mm. think they think of him, that this kid is like. Uh, their beta you know where it's like oh mm -hmm. yeah you're not as good as us that's essentially what happens right right yeah exactly um also on that note i think it's interesting that the movie chooses to talk about or rather the movie of seems to avoid and one of the things we're like pointing at and going it doesn't do enough a uh, solvency for this would be shame right if, yeah. if james really felt shame we might actually be a little bit more clear on like how he navigates the space in act two and three right because then we'd be like okay that's a human response to feel shameful about the things that you're doing right uh and it's interesting because cronenberg chooses to show kind of the um once again the systemization of shame or like mecha me uh, mechanisms that ultimately are in place to avoid shame. For example, once he comes to terms in the first like kind of like 25 minutes, he comes to terms with, oh my God, it's either kill me or do whatever this doubling system is. Right. <clears throat> and he's just like, well, I don't want to die. So yeah, I sign and consent the papers. Smash cut to him at like a, sh a shitty ATM. Uh, and it's just like, the capitalism walk of shame, you know, like, yeah, and going you get this to implication that the country is pulling a grift, right? right? Like, they basically are just like, everybody has pointed fingers at you. We're going to pro like he bear he doesn't get a chance to defend himself. There's no due process. They There's strong no. on arm him and they're like, we're going to kill you. The crime is execution. Or you can walk to that ATM and give and us money right now. Fucked up thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that so we do see. We do see elements of shame in that how the system kind of hides it away from people, but we don't really see the actors in the play essentially have shame, uh, which would have been a valuable part, right. I think, of like if you're really trying to talk about humanity. And that's what I think I'm coming to terms with, even though I still stand by everything I said earlier about I think it's got problems with Act 3 and I wish it talked about something else. But like that's a different movie. So who am I to ask for that? Uh, but like ultimately, uh, there's there's a lot there that he's going for that is that is interesting talking specifically about systems not about humans and that's yeah. just a, something that he's going for which i'm like okay i see I bet. yeah the the shame the the flip is like that first time he goes in you get this real oh shit feeling where he's out of control mm -hmm. he's the victim in that situation to then the next time they go in and they're literally sitting there and they're like they should have something to drink for us, you know, <laughs> like they're yeah. complaining about the service because you realize that this terrifying thing, that the, the thing that was terrifying when they first presented it, um, once you realize what it is, uh, these people are no longer terrified of it. And in fact, it's, uh, feel like entitled. <laughs> yeah, it's it becomes to them a feature, not a bug. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think that that is an interesting thing to say about humans, about acceptance and how they derive joy from things and justify horrible nonsense to themselves. And that's the movie I think I wanted. But this movie 
it just seems like the premise wanted he wanted to take it somewhere else probably because yeah. we've got movies kind of like the thing that i'm describing I have a it weird, just feels like the standard thing yeah i have a weird theory if you're yeah. the son of david cronenberg you probably mm-hmm. have met a lot of rich people true uh, and been to all these parties and he really wants to take them down yeah and i'm wondering if like because i don't doubt there are rich people who would do this in the world but i think for the average viewer we kind of need more than that you know what i mean like that's yeah. what it was to me is like i uh, like again i accepted that these rich people would be this sadistic but james the character kind of just jumps into it um and like you said it's not completely unrealistic but it is still like these people are alien to the majority of people watching this the majority yes. of people watching this would say i don't understand why they would want to do this period they everybody would be m you know the one who's like i'm getting the fuck out of here um yeah yeah so, people are like this is a terrible place and why is it like this and you know what it's much easier just to leave yeah and why wouldn't james leave why would he and so i guess like it's he just passed up a lot of being able to make the world more believable for like i think it's just a very cynical uh portrait of rich people which i happen to agree with i do (laughs) but for the sake of storytelling it's just harder to tell the story without um (coughs) explaining like what it is is like i really wanted to see like how does a person like james become like them um and like it they don't really have that because he just likes it immediately yeah it's that and it's, then, like, the mm-hmm. implication is, like, yeah, maybe he'll go back. We're not even sure where he's at by the end. Um, if he's been indoctrinated into this group, you know? Like, yeah. I thought it was going to end with him more, like, being gung-ho into it. Um, but he he kind of is... his He doesn't really have that much of an arc, I guess. He really doesn't. Uh, in, in the way that it's, like, him wrestling with his humanity, once again, he does have an arc in terms of... Uh, you know, is there's questions that come up in Act Three that are more like, is this real? Yeah. Um, not like necessarily like, am I the clone? But like, is he going? To, how far is he going to go? Uh, in order to stay apart, stay alive, which right. is not something that you would necessarily ask yourself if you're you're grappling with this I whole do, thing of I'm killing myself. Yeah, I do. And then at the, the end, he does murder himself because he's threatened by himself. His, right, his clone says like I'm gonna kill you. Uh, Again, they give him a knife, and he's like, "I'm not doing this." And it's like, <coughs> "Dude, you saw someone slit your own throat, right? <laughs> like, what's the what's so different about this?" Um, if they, and I, it should be noted, they've shown him commit terrible acts on other people too. Right. Um, if they had made that the line where like he keeps refusing to participate in the crimes, you know what I mean? Right. Like he abets it. Uh, he's there, but he doesn't like kill anybody. Then that would be a line. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. but it's very hard to figure out where his line is. I do think there was like part of the reason the drugs and the cloning are similar is that you could probably say like, Oh, during that orgy sequence, maybe they did clone him. Maybe he is is. not himself there. Yeah. I was going to, I was going to ask that question about that. At a certain point, I feel like the police are just giving these people clones. Right. Right. And that, I think that's what he wants us to think is like at a certain point, it's not, it's kind of like who knows like mm-hmm. who even fucking knows at this point yeah they just got scars guards flying off the shelves yeah um yeah it's real fucked up um in terms of like the like i i mean it's fucked up story wise but like uh like from the standpoint of you know like what they're doing but it's also kind of fucked up in terms of like what the movie's doing because i need to kind of know these answer these questions in order for it to be believable like it gets like at a certain point the movie does this whole like hallucinogenic kind of uh thing where it's like oh that's cool it uh, gives an excuse to give this cool kind of imagery you know but i think it makes the focus far too much toward is this real which isn't really what is needed at this point in the movie i think ultimately uh, it oh sorry no 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 that's you know your thoughts ultimately it feels like it's going for hype 
And what I mean by that right. is that we all have those fucked up indie movies that we put on as teenagers and get high and go mm-hmm. watch this shit. This shit's crazy, you know? Right. And like, I think it it's less worried with um, what it's trying to say and more like, like at the nursing scene, <laughs> I was just like, what? Why? <laughs> Why is that the thing now? Yeah, is why is that the thing he does? Is um, it return to primal self? Like, right? What, is it just because it's fucking about, weird? Um, a lot of the cinematography is that when he takes a leak on the beach, it's like close up of his pee, and then she gives him See, the the a nerving hand job, and it's a close that's up. That's actually of um, uh, that's and, actually something I noticed is that uh, I thought the cinematography was fucking on point this whole movie it oh, killed nice. it all the time and it does something that I love it did something that uh, Villeneuve does uh, like you've seen Enemy um, where that's another doppelganger story uh, something unique to this movie is that if you rewatch it or if you haven't seen it you're going to give it a, a, a look directorially look at all of the frames and when you're watching try to keep in your head uh, why is a lot of action happening at only the bottom of frame? Like Ooh. everything is draining downward. Um, and I think it has to do with this. Uh, it's also this failing naturally um, kind of speech that Mia Goth gives about trying to convince someone of being like false. I think there's this draining uh, thing that happens with these uh, with this movie and I think it has to do with the infinity pool right. uh, and which we I think we should definitely talk about the you know symbolism of that uh, also this movie has these like upside down canting landscapes is how the movie starts it also yeah. is in a few and I think that that's like literally it's like it's like what I think this movie is doing is it's basically like cutting the throat of like an animal and then hanging it up so it bleeds. I was going to say, yeah, the simplest version is we're seeing a paradise from unnerving angles, right? Right. From angles yeah. that make them lo- it look genuinely hideous oh, in hideous weird ways. And deformed, yeah. Um, yeah. It, I guess that's what I mean about, yeah, style over substance where it's like it, this is more like a really good painting Right. Um, of an abstract concept so exactly. it's it's not really focused on people or characters or like mm-hmm. you know like it, it's more of a uh, um a piece of art in that sense uh, it's funny it's, me it's and more uh, surrealist than me and it ad ta- adam talks excellent. about this in the last frame right uh it keeps coming up but we we looked at have you seen good time no uh, that's the uh, Safdie brothers. Uh, this concept of post cinema, the post cinema movement, where it, it talks about that, and it's kind of like a post J.J. Abrams kind of world, where we all we're now so enthralled with the now that like the reasons why or what's about to happen next, we're on such rails with movies now. And a lot of movies, including like Marvel movies, but also art house movies like this movie and, um, you know, Good Time, I would I would say that that's in the post cinema movement because it's so uh, indoctrinated into the present that even your characters, but like the filmmakers, the 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 viewers, they're no longer like, what, how do I react to this? How How is it's more of just like what's next? Yeah. As well, you know, I yeah, I talked about this with uh, the new Ant-Man, which is that. Weirdly enough, I think movies like Ant Man, which I think were terrible, um, I also think is proof that audiences are getting smarter because mm-hmm. uh, we can fill in a lot more blanks for movies because we've seen it all, right? Like Ant Man is just like it's the quantum realm, and we all go, "Sure, yeah. I don't need that explained." Uh, and they can take advantage of that. And what I mean by that is they will let the audience do all the work that the writers should have done. And that's why that's a bad movie, in my opinion. Point being that um, uh, I think that the same can go for movies like this, right? Where audiences are so sophisticated enough that they can fill in the blanks if they need to. Um, in the end, it's all kind of the same thing where it comes down to, for me, is that if you are enjoying the actual journey of the movie, you're not going to care if it doesn't all add up, is right. what you're kind of saying. Yeah, yeah, like that if seems to be the thrust yeah, of the movement. If you like the jokes in Ant Man or the action, which I didn't, you're not going to care. It didn't make sense. Same with this movie. Same with every mm-hmm. movie. Um, uh, where it's like if the visuals uh, uh appeal to you, 
then yeah, it, it's you're gonna forgive that shit. If you and in va- fact, if it's you might vibe, even have a smart enough brain that you can just fill in the blanks in a way that's satisfying to you. It does put more of the onus on the viewer. It kind of does. Is something yeah. that is antithetical to classic cinema right which is like i will show you this shot and then this shot because the juxtaposition of those shots mean a thing that i'm trying to get you to think of this is like i don't know i'm just flying off the cuff here but like this shot and this shot and this is just what i'm instinctually feeling you can retroactively gather uh meaning or you know thought experiments from that right but ultimately what you have is the here and now and the you know the tone, the vibe. The- right. You look at you look at the success of a movie like Skinnamarink, which is all vibes, mm-hmm. very all little vibes. plot, and audiences were just like I like people were putting their own personal experiences it's just like on this. It. Yeah, and I um, think it's and, a part of yeah. how we watch movies now, and um, that's kind of great because like like for even from everything from the the worst blockbusters to 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 shit like this and Skinnamarink. Like it, mm-hmm. it all sort of to me leads to that our brains, our way of l- watching movies have become more sophisticated. Uh, I agree. And that, I, yeah. And that can result in some shitty films, in my opinion, or some great films uh, yeah. that take advantage of that fact. And I don't think it's all films now because I think a lot there's a lot, still a lot of throwback happening. But ultimately, I do think that there is a movement that's occurring that is treating the audiences a little bit smarter. Yeah, I also but think- also a little bit dumber in some ways too, where it's like yeah. saying, <clears throat> "I don't think about that," and I think that that can also have negative effects. I think some people are going to be like, "I don't like that movement," and that's true about genres and movements. Some people like some stuff; some people don't like other they're, stuff. Yeah, it's they're both ways. I what I think is that there, are, they're both ways for a writer to get away with being very lazy. They don't have to be lazy. It's they don't. But have they to can, know. and they it's the same. It's like a, abstract cinema is very is the same. Where like you could make a piece of abstract art, and people would interpret it every way they want, mm-hmm. and like the writer could just go, "Yes, it's there to be interpreted," and it's like, mm-hmm. so you don't know, do you? <laughs> you don't know what you were yeah. making. <laughs> You just Man, knew that it would come off that way. I recently, just as like a hangout, um, Michael and I watched Blue Velvet. Oh yeah, and I'm just not a Lynch guy. I'm just right. ne- I've never been a Lynch guy. I don't know what it is. Um, and uh, there's a lot of my good friends. I've been to film schools that people are like Lynch. Yes, he's he's the king. And I'm like, I see how from a craftsman perspective, he's good. But like Blue Velvet, I'm just like, this is nonsense. They're just doing whatever David Lynch wants. He's like, <laughs> stand on the car. Uh, Dennis Hopper, just start screaming mommy. And I'm like, but what does it mean? <laughs> And he's like, and so, some people get it. I don't get it. I must be dumb when it That's comes to That's the thing is like with abstract art, it's right. I think like I came from an art world too. And I've seen galleries where people have literally painted mm. squares mm. and putting them up yes, and people yes. are doing all the work for that artist. <laughs> and I'm like, he just painted squares. Fuck you. You know? Yeah. Fuck you. It's a little bit. Fuck you. I don't know why. Um, but I think that that's that's a whole part of the wonderful, you know, circus well, the yeah, cavalcade of chaos the thing that is, we're on. If that uh, if that artist then said, "Oh, you don't understand. These squares represent this very that, specific thing, and yeah, this is what I I'm meant like, by mm-hmm. it, and it makes sense." Then it's like, "Oh, oh that's okay, actually yeah, really yeah. smart." That can happen. That can happen. Yeah. I can be totally dumb. That's how I started this whole uh, observation. I can but just that's not get it. It's more that abstract art is a it's something that a writer can hide behind if right. they if they want to. And, but um, I just wanted to say my point uh, was just that some people <clears throat> enjoy that and it gets them and like it's not just necessarily vibes. It's like I got something from that um, and I, I, there's a symbolism and I'm searching for and I'm not doing the right. post cinema thing where I'm like saying it doesn't matter. I am doing the very like s- structural thing where it's like what does that image mean and how does it juxtapose to the other thing? Classic cinema. And uh, and I it wor- it works on me and I yeah a lover of movies uh, not all movies work on me uh, some stuff works and that's what I'm saying is my, just that it's yeah fun. my favorite is the in between stuff like under the skin where when yeah, you yeah, watch yeah. that movie you can kind of identify exactly what's happening 
and even but the it's weird all scenes yeah kind of like a weird metaphorical space or you know yeah the way that movie uses like the the null space is very cool yeah because it's like yeah you can't even conceive of what's happening to these people right now right and uh, i think that's the thing is i think that the best use of abstract art is to show intangible ideas. Skinamarink is actually a good example of it because it's trying to show like an afterlife or a coma or demonic presence. And Mm. it's like, that is the most creepy when it's abstract, um, where it's beyond our comprehension. So it works. Whereas in this film, the cloning process just felt like a music video. (laughs) Where it's like, why is that the cloning process? Why are those images him being cloned? Um, that's that feels to me like more style than oh this is like like that idea that when you're getting cloned when scars is getting cloned he's having weird naked fantasies of mia goth <laughs> dancing yeah. and like and it's just like why would that be what he's thinking when he's getting cloned why is that the visual why representation that the visual? of that yeah maybe he does have an mind. answer but i can't give you that answer based off watching the movie that's what it comes down to me because i can excuse that a little bit just because it's like yeah that is the vibe stuff that's just there for vibes and tone right and there's tone poems movies that i do enjoy watching where i turn off the part of like the symbolism brain like uh, assassination jesse james by the car or robert ford like where i go like okay if i stop watching this as a movie and i'm just like here for like the vibes that I'm then I'm like yeah okay uh, I see how this movie is very effective it's a tone poem uh yeah I mean I like 2001 for that reason but I would argue that 2001 still has makes sense in its visuals here's here's what hangs me up in this movie for example there are times which uh Cronenberg is asking you begging for you to interpret events in a symbolic way uh he titled infinity pool this is at one point a story about infinity pool which goes to theme where he talks about uh one of the characters in the movie says uh they're building a luxury resort pool and it accidentally like a, a thing fell and it killed two workers so it's a symbol for the wants of the rich killing the poor and the extreme loopholes that are created for them over time um and so that is on theme and then also the fact that infinity pool visually is a pool with no edge it's got no boundary where there should be one but also it works because it's a visual illusion so there's no boundary but it just doesn't look like there's one so it's it's a very deliberate metaphor for the morality of the movie where it's like there is a boundary there absolutely is a boundary you can't get away with this shit even though they do but you just perceive no boundary because of the visual is illusion because of some hack you did to your brain called money um so it's asking me for that kind of inspection of just the title of the movie yet at other times it's like turn off that brain here's me a goth walk right, don't you worry like a dog it. yeah and it's just like, don't worry about it. And I'm like, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to read and what I'm not. And that does bother me a little bit because I I can be fine with something like Assassination of Jesse James, where it's like none of this visually is supposed to compel me to think or meditate on any one specific thing. I'm just here for, you know, a poem, um, you know. Right. So it, I don't it, know. it doesn't have to mean every, you know. Movies don't have to fucking mean something in every shot. It's just that this movie definitely, yeah, calls its shot ahead of time and says, pay attention. This is art. It's more (laughs) that, is it the kind of movie that wants me to be thinking about that or is it not? Like, how should I be watching it? Right. And I think that it's the director's job to say, think about it. Think about this if you want, if I want you to think about this or don't think about it at all. Just enjoy the ride. Right. Right. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that I got stuck on that, which is ultimately why, like, I didn't love this movie. That isn't to say I hated it. I liked it. I enjoyed watching it. In fact, one of my notes was just this movie flew by. Like it really did. It really does. Two-hour movie. I I was fucking. I was glued to the screen. Um, I recommend it to people who like weird, fucked up movies for sure. Mm. And I can't wait to see Cronenberg's next movie. Uh, I hope he has, I hope Mm -hmm. he makes as many as his father, if not more. 
Um, it also makes movies like that recently have come out, like I'm looking at you, Triangle of Sadness, look like they got kitten paws on. <laughs> you're right, you know, right, like, right. Yeah. That said, like, I think I like oh, Triangle of Sadness more than this. I think it's a more consistent movie, but I yeah. think this movie get cuts right cuts right in there and just starts ripping flesh apart. Oh yeah. And that's what you're that's what you're wanting. Yeah. For um, me personally, for I don't know if you had Cronenberg. this reaction. This was like a laugh movie for me. Where you know when a movie is so like tragic or horrible that you just start laughing because it's and it's part of it is like there's no there's not uh, since the characters are more abstract concepts like there's no one I'm feeling bad for either really like uh, obviously they're victims but like again it's just like at a certain point you're like this is funny. (laughs) It's the, just yeah, funny the, how fucked the one up it's I laughed gotten. at is that like at the dinner or the drinks when after Skarsgård just you know he's freshly holding his urn from the first clone death, uh, and he's uh, he has he meets with several of Albin and Gabby's friends who, uh, and Gabby's played by Mia Goth like the 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 crew that he starts rolling with right. these you, these fucking <laughs> they, they, these teenagers that are all old old right pathetic wealthy people they open and gleefully call themselves zombies and flesh eaters and you just believe in any like the tone of the conversation is that at any time anyone could just pitch hey you guys want to kill a baby yeah and they'd just be like yeah you know yeah, like, that's the okay. vibe and that's what i think he like all right guess what uh you know dave's saying about how fu- like it's kind of a laugh movie because they're so outrageously horrible to like other yeah. people uh, yeah, exactly. When a movie becomes so no sadis- uh, sadistic, it yeah. starts getting funny. Also, uh, uh, bless those TSA employees who are going to have to deal with all those urns. Yeah, I'm sure they're at a certain point. They're like, listen, just don't question the urns. Just yeah, there's just we got a lot of urns coming out of this country. Yeah, uh, you can look it up online. I don't want to tell you why. Just don't mm-hmm. question them. Just let it. I be. love that there is that shot at the end where he's packing up before he decides to come back he's packing up and he he like he just puts his hand on the three urns that he's got yeah and it's just like khaleesi's dragon eggs like he has so much reverence for them like these are my babies yeah Yeah. uh it's cute it's a cute little death uh yeah death of himself just little scars guards all Mm. burnt up uh yeah so i'd say that that is probably a wrap on our conversation unless there's something else you wanted to point no, out. No, that, that's that's pretty much all I had. Like I feel like I got everything I got wanted to say. Yeah, it was it was a fun movie. It was fine. It it mm-hmm. yeah, I still, you know, I wasn't blown Visually, away by it. Vi- yeah, like story-wise we had our, you know, cuz you and I usually come at it from a story perspective because that's, you know, very near and dear to our hearts and right. we write we write uh there's something about me especially the director part of me that i'm like this is cool and i wouldn't necessarily agree 100 uh, percent of the time when you say like style over substance even though i do in mass or in on balance agree yeah. with you I like it really in, yeah. it I, really is a something you could watch and just like if you're into that cronenberg kind of vibe if you watch possessor i would definitely say give it a look oh for sure um it's definitely got visually captivating sequences yeah. and like and like Dave said it uh it moves quickly it's like a pretty quick it's 118 minutes but it feels even shorter yeah it's a fun you know it's a fun little romp if you like weird fun up little movies. Romp. like yeah. if i was a teenager i would get super high and watch this with friends oh yeah you know? and then you get to see mia goth walking uh, alexander skarsgard like a dog feeding yeah. him a bowl of drugs which is i'll say it a fetish I didn't know I had. Yeah, you're gonna learn some fetishes watching this um, movie. Mm-hmm. That's just how it is. Yep. I There's do. This. By the way, Mia Goth continues to be just a treasure. Stellar, stellar. Yeah. yeah. Not enough of our podcast was went into how much she brings it. Everybody's uh, good in this, but like Mia Goth captivating. is a fucking superstar in the horror world now. Yeah, and Skarsgård brings it. Uh, he's all over the place, and like. <laughs> yeah. But like, yeah, she really is very consistent. She's one very specific thing. And it's just, how do you not love that? Yeah. it's um, kind So of like, if anything, watch it for that too. If you're on like a Nickelodeon show, you know, you're going to be slimed, you know, and you yeah, just yeah, you're yeah, into yeah. it. When you're on a Cronenberg film, doesn't matter which Cronenberg, you know that you might like nurse somebody 
or like fight <laughs> your a naked version of yourself. Like you're prepared. Yeah, it's, you're it's gonna, gonna have, get gooey. For, you're gonna you know, hold a bloody baby, or yeah. you, it's gonna be gooey. So you're gonna get slimed. Yeah, it's you exactly know this is gonna be like your best known <laughs> film. You know it's gonna be like a real fucked up little journey that you'll go on. Yeah. If you had, if all you had to do is stand in some goo and pay like five thousand dollars to make a clone, would you clone yourself, Dave? Yeah. And then I, yeah, cool. of course. You'd I'm not even asking too, about the right? murder. I just, would you clone yourself, Dave? Yeah, I don't clone. know if I. I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't do it, and I wouldn't. Okay, yeah, I wouldn't you know what I would myself. do? What would you do? I clone you myself clone so many times that it becomes a problem for others. Yeah, like for are, the world. You are a spicy little enchilada, Dave. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yep, that's how it goes, and that's a frame rate. Uh, Dave, where can people find you? And thank you for being here. Of course, thanks for having me. Listen, I, I I run a podcast network with Tom Ryman that you probably know about called Gamefully Unemployed. That's G A M E F U L O Y Unemployed. Uh, you know, we've been doing stuff with you, Abe. You you're over there. You've been I'm over guest there. hosting Hypecast lately. Um, if you Google that, you'll find all the podcasts. We also have a Patreon, patreon.com slash gamefully unemployed. Uh, we do podcasts with the small beans. Uh, we do uh, uh, Star Trek the Next Futurama and Spiel Boys. We also have our own on there. Uh, Tom and Jeff watch Batman. Fox Mulder's a maniac. We watch movies every Friday night with our patrons. Gamefullyunemployed.com gets you our merch sco- store. I'm on Twitter at who movie hooligan. Uh, mm-hmm. There's also Gamefully Gamefully Un on Twitter as well. We're someday going to go on other social media platforms, and that is it. And that is it. Yes. So go do those things. Click those things and yeah. let your eyeballs and earballs oh, get I love infected, the earballs. With, infected with the sounds of Dave. Mm. Um, yeah, you know where you are. You are. This is Small Beans Podcast. It's called Frame Rate. We got other stuff. Uh, if you're a part of the free feed right now, uh, consider uh, hopping over to patreon.com slash small beans because there you can get exclusive shows like the ones that Dave mentioned which are collaborations and others that are just straight up uh, exclusives to uh, to small beans like escape from the multikers uh, <clears throat> that's it you're done you, you, you know what you listen to a podcast today why don't you, you, you take a breather out. yeah take a breather take a breather you know Go pat yourself cloned. on the back yeah good job everybody nice nice work all right everybody disperse and go